Y gracias a nuestro invitado, a, a Rafael Molina, eh, muchos lo conocéis, profesor de, del Departamento de Ciencia de la Computación e Inteligencia Artificial de la Universidad de Granada y un reconocido investigador con una larga trayectoria en el ámbito de la visión artificial. Es decir, bueno, pues su trayectoria es, eh, bueno, desde su origen, recuerdo cuando yo llegué al departamento, creo que Rafa en aquel momento estaba, volvía de una estancia en Oxford, si no recuerdo mal, con Ripley, era, que era el referente en el ámbito de, de Computer Vision en los años 90, y bueno, pues desde entonces ha desarrollado Rafa una ingente trayectoria de trabajo en distintos ámbitos de, de, de la visión artificial, eh, editor asociado en diversas revistas, ha recibido eh, varios premios con los trabajos, como trabajo más relevante de, de varios congresos, y para nosotros, pues la verdad que es un placer, un honor que nos acompañe esta tarde, Rafa. Muchísimas gracias y bueno, a tu disposición. Muchas gracias por invitarme. Me, me dijo Pablo que prefería que fuera en inglés. No, lo, lo hago en inglés, ¿no? no, no por mí sí, no hay... Pablo, sí, lo, hemos quedado por difusión en inglés, ¿no, Pablo? ¿Lo mantenemos en inglés? Sí, eh, podemos continuar, sí, por, por coherencia con las demás podemos hacerlo en inglés, pero evidentemente está abierto a modificaciones. Pero en un principio habíamos hablado de hacerlo en inglés. No, 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 lo, lo hacemos en inglés, no hay problema. Bueno, empiezo. Bueno. First of all, let me uh, thank you all for, for attending the, the talk. Rafael Nadal is playing now, so I guess that uh, you don't like tennis much. I, I really like it, so hopefully staying with me, uh, I really appreciate it. But let me also thank uh, Pablo for, for inviting me to, to give this talk, which is long overdue because in theory it was going to be in September last year, but then I was teaching, so we decided to move it uh, to the second quarter, and then finally we, we have made it uh, today. Um, Pablo told me as well that this is mainly intended to uh, the meeting to or the, the conference or seminar to, to PhD students. Uh, probably all of you are already working on, on topics which are quite different from, from the modeling I'm using here. Um, in this presentation, but maybe it may be of interest to look at how the problem you are solving or try to solve um, can be approached using variational inference and, and modeling. I'll, I'll try to make a, a brief intro introduction to the problem. Uh, there is some math, maybe it sounds a bit complicated to you in some uh, step in some slides, but in general, I think it's not difficult to follow. But in any case, if you have any questions, comments, or either at the end of the presentation or, or you send me an email and, and we can talk when, when you want. I have prepared more, more slides than I, I, I need. Um, I think I have over 70 slides and I only have 45 minutes. So um, probably I'll skip some of the example I have introduced, but then you can look at them and get back to me if you if you want to know more about the topic. Then um, regarding this, this talk, uh, also it had, um, it's an, an evolution of a previous talk I've, I have already presented. I mean, 2011, I was invited to participate in a workshop in NIP that took place here in, in Granada. And then since then I have been preparing talk on my research and the things we do, we do in the in the group. So this is somehow the summary of the things we, we are doing or we have been doing for for the last basically 10 years. We did other things in the past, but uh, these are the areas where we are currently researching on. So let me let me move to the to a bit uh, a brief introduction to the to the people in the group. Here you can see the the people um, who are in the group and also three collaborators I have been working with for a very long while. I would like to concentrate on the on the student or former student, Santiago and Pablo. They, they completed their PhD uh, in October and January this year. Um, Santiago is moving to, to Northwestern University and Pablo is just back from an internship in, at Microsoft in Cambridge. Miguel Lopez is, uh, has been, has a contract uh, financed by a project. Uh, Fernando is an FBI uh, associated to a project and Arne, I don't pronounce his name properly, but he will be called Arne here in Spain, 
is a PhD student um, financed by the, um, the European Union in a, in a network which is named Clarify. So the rest of the people you know then, um, I would like to thank the student for, for the, the great do job they are doing in, in their thesis. So this is um, um, also related to this, I know that you are working on, on, the, on your topic, on, the, on your area of research, but we have been just uh, granted uh, a project has been financed for almost two years. And then we are looking for, for PhD student. If you know someone who may be interested in, in doing some maths with application, please let them know that to contact me um, for, for me to tell him or her then the work we, we have to do in the project. So let me, before starting with a bit of maths, let me introduce the, the problem, a few problems I have been working with um, for I don't know how many years. And this is even related to what uh, um, Paco said uh, a while ago. That I started to work in this problem when I went to visit Brian Ripley in 1987, first at Stadtklai University in Glasgow and then uh, in, in, in Oxford University. Then the, this is the, the, an image you, you are given and, and then you, you want to obtain the, the real underlying image. You don't know the blur and then you want to estimate the blur as, as well as the original image. That is um, an image restoration and image processing problem. And here you have a classification problem where you have a tumor, you have histological images on the left and the, the images can be annotated by different annotators. Some of them annotated the same, the same slice or patch. For instance, the first one has been annotated by the first and the last uh, annotator the second, and they agree on the annotation. The second sample has been uh, annotated by uh, you see here three of them and they agree on the annotation as well. Uh, the color represent uh, a class and then and for sample number three, you can see that the, the first annotator has said nothing about it because that person has not been given that sample. The second one has said that it's the class blue and the last one in the class green. Um, basically, the idea is that you you have a slide, a patch on, on your right, then you pass it through a VGG, well, the way we have approached it then, to a feature extractor, and then to each uh, patch you assign a class which has been provided by, annotate, by an annotator. The annotator may have a different degree of expertise, some of them may be extremely good, they, they, have, they are expert, other they are becoming a specialist, and then you want to, to build a model to classify the histological images. And then here you have the, the tool we use, which is a, a, a Gaussian process and a sparse Gaussian process. And then the, the model we are looking for or, or try to estimate will, will not only give us the, uh, the, the underlying classifier, the good classifier that allows us to classify the, the, the images, the whole slice images. The, the, uh, the method we are looking for should also be able to tell us how each annotator behaves. So set in the notes in the, uh, the underlying uh, class, the true underlying class, and double, um, why is the, the label provided by, by the annotator. So we, we want to estimate this is not given. We want to estimate this matrix as well as, as the real underlying um, classifier. So these are examples, I wouldn't say of two extreme problems, but there are two problems we, we have been dealing with in, in, in the past. And then from my point of view, uh, this problem and many more share a, a, a thing. It, and that's important thing, in my opinion is that they can be modeled and um, using um, Bayesian modeling and also inference can be done using Bayesian inference. So what I am going to, to do in, in this presentation is I'll briefly talk about my starting point, how I became interested in, in, in the field of Bayesian modeling and, and inference. Then I'll talk briefly about Bayesian network. Then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about variational base inference. It's going to be a short uh, uh, introduction, no more than hopefully more, less than 20 minutes, where you will know the basic of the variational base inference. Um, 
it, I know that it sounds complicated when you start working on, uh, you say, Bayesian inference or variational base uh, inference. It sounds like, why do I have to use that? Why should I move? I wouldn't say move, at least know a bit more about variational inference. So I, I want to explain here the basic for you to be able to read if you have if you haven't done that already be able to to read a paper which is variational inference to solve something which is related to the problem you are trying to solve finally and this is probably the the most interesting part is uh, my plan is to show you um, a few examples of things that we have been doing um, on application of the model we have this is a an example i mean it's a long while ago that uh, is when I went to, to Glasgow in 87 with a grant. I stayed there for six months. And then I went to, to, to work with Brian Ripley on the following problem. We were provided with images like the one you have on, on the right, uh, are images of a galaxy, and those images are blurred because they have been taken from a telescope on Earth. So you have all the turbulences in the atmosphere, and then you want to, to recover the, the original image. The, there are... Um, Additional problems there, you can probably see here the, the white line, these are called hot lines, because the sensor doesn't work very well, uh, and the idea is to remove that as well. At that time, that was 87, that was when I went to, to Glasgow, the only thing we, we did was the following one. We, um, because the problem was complicated, or at least to us was, was very, very complicated. Um, and we said, okay, uh, what do we know about the problem? What do we know about those images? And those are images that are galaxies where the luminosity decay on an exponential way from, from the galaxy center. I mean, at the beginning, we were trying simple model like conditional autoregressives, regressive or simultaneous autoregressive. But then we started to use the same thing on log scale. So we were using a prior model here, the terminology is important. For me, a prior for other people is a regular a regularizer or a regularization term. Uh, so we have a, a regularization term or a prior. I prefer to use the, the, the term prior because it, it gives you more information on things that you can do. Um, and then you, you use the prior, which say that what is happening at one each pixel in log scale is that the, the value you, you observe, the, the real and the line value, is close to the mean of the four pixel around. That is the modeling you are introducing. That is the constraint, if you want, you are introducing in the, in the model. That is, you are looking for a, an image which is going to be close to, to the observation in the sense that when convolving the real and the line image with the blur, should be close to your observation. But together with that, you add a constraint. You say that the image has to be a smooth or log scale, right? If you think of that at that time, what we were doing basically was the maximum a, a posteriori. So you have a prior term. In this case, the prior was on the log scale of, of the image because of the smoothness on log scale. And then you also have the observation model. So you have P of Z, the prior, and P of X given Z, the observation model. And then you say, okay, which restoration, what image do, should I obtain? Should I use that as the restoration? And then the approach was, let's get the maximum a posteriori for, for the distribution we have been using for the prior, P of Z, and the, for the observation, P of X given Z. That was the, the work we, we were doing at the moment, at, at that time in 87. At that time, we were not thinking about calculating the posterior distribution of Z, uh, estimating uncertainty of the model, nothing like that. By the way, you may find this a, a bit different from, from what you do in, in your research, but think of, for instance, of a neural network or a deep neural network. So imagine that the, in the prior, in, in the weight of, of the neural network, you introduce a constraint like a quadratic penalty term that acts as a prior model on the weight. Then also you have the observation model, which relates your input to the final output, right? So at the end, you, you have a prior on the model, which is 
the probability distribution, the one related to the Gaussian um, observ to the Gaussian modeling of weight, and then you have the observation. You combine the observations, the, the modeling of the observation process with the, the prior, and then basically what you do when you use deep learning in the classical sense, where the only thing you do is to estimate the parameters of, of the net, is to calculate the maximum a posteriori. However, you, you all will know that uh, we will probably would like to have more information than just the maximum a, a posteriori of, of for the weight, for the W, we would like to know the, the uncertainty, uh, the posterior distribution of W, because knowing that is going to be much more interesting than just providing um, a simple, a unique, uh, only one estimate of the, of the weight. So this is the, the work we did. Um, then you, you have the observation, uh, which is the one I showed before, and then the restoration on the right. There, there is obviously here a, a, a question to be answered, but how do we know that this model is, re, is real, that our restoration is a correct one? Well, the reason why we can do that, uh, we can say that the restoration is correct is because we, at that time we had images taken uh, um, with the sensor at the different wavelengths and the spot you see here, they, 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 they appear here that was, they, they were not uh, in the observation, they are real because the, uh, when using a different uh, a sensor with a different uh, wavelength, they also appear uh, at those wavelengths. So with that brief intro introduction um, to what I have done and a couple of problems at the beginning, let me go and spend some minutes, no more than 20, minutes on the modeling, on the mathematical model um, I have been using in my research for, for quite a long while in the, in the simplest form, the maximum a posteriori, and then after an evolution uh, going into the variational inference direction. Um, I'll be dealing with the uh, Bayesian network um, and those Bayesian network are distribution which are associated to direct a cyclic graph like the one on your right. The probability distribution associated to that one is, is quite simple. So you have this node, y1, 2, and 3. So you have the probability of this one, this one, and this one. And then for each node which uh, with parents, so you consider the, the conditional probability of the node given the, uh, its um, ancestor. So you have the probability of y1, y2, y3, times the probability of y4 given one, two, or three, and three, as well for y5, uh, and the same for six and for seven. So we, we are concerned, we are going to be concerned here for um, um, calculating posterior distribution. When you talk about posterior distribution, you may think of a mass math estimation. It's going to be much more than the map what we are going to do. So we are going to assume that we have observed a few nodes, let's say these two, for instance, and then we want to calculate the posterior distribution of the, the other one, the, those which have, haven't been observed given the observation we have. We are going to concentrate on models like, like the one on, on your right. So you, you, those models correspond to directed uh, a cyclic uh, graph. Of course, in, inside each node, the, the, the modeling you may have may not be of the uh, directed acyclic graph, it may, may be a direct graph, but the, for the unit, we, we, for instance, it may be an image and then the prior in the image is not a directed acyclic graph, but at high level, you, you are going to have a directed acyclic graph. And then what you want to do is, you assume that you, you are given the observation at some particular nodes and want to calculate the posterior distribution of the rest of, of, the, of the value. So the idea is to calculate the posterior distribution of, of the unknown variable given the observation. The first, let's go to, back to my first example. In the first example, Z is the real underlying image. X is the, the observation we have. So we want to calculate the posterior distribution on all the possible um, restoration underlying images. Um, why do we want to calculate the posterior distribution and not only the mean? Because, well, not the mean, the mode, the mode in this case. Because the mode is a very poor summa, summary of, of, of a distribution. I mean, if they tell you that the mode, the mode of one distribution is here on the left and then 
all the mass of the distribution is on the right, the, the, the mode is, is not a good summary of the distribution you are dealing with. So I think to know a distribution, you, you need to know its uncertainty, the mean, the mode, or as much information as, as you, um, you can get. So we basically want to calculate the posterior distribution. But then the first question that appeared is, is that an easy goal? Well, uh, sorry. Well, in some cases it is. If, you, for instance, if, if you if you are dealing with an image and then the prior model you are utilizing on the image is a simple uh, simultaneous autoregressive one like the one here, which is a quadratic. At the end of the day, is a Gaussian distribution. And then you have here an observation model which is also Gaussian. You can easily calculate the posterior distribution of Z given X. So you can estimate the whole posterior distribution. You start with a prior, which is Gaussian. Your observation model is also Gaussian. Then the posterior distribution of Z, given the, the, the observation that you have, is also um, a Gaussian distribution. However, with a simple modification like the, like the one here, instead of using the quadratic term, which tell us we are working with Gaussian, things are easy. Uh, you can use a, a absolute value, the Laplace distribution, and then things become much more complicated. You cannot calculate easily uh, the posterior distribution in closer form, and then you need to, to look for approximation, right? So basically what we are doing is, okay, I want to calculate the posterior distribution. This is my goal. Go and you give me some observation, and then for all the things I don't know, I want to calculate the posterior distribution. By the way, think of a classification problem, machine learning problem. Uh, this can also be formulated uh, this way. So we want to calculate the posterior distribution or what we don't know given the observation we have. Why the posterior distribution? Because it's richer than just having one point estimate. Now we have to, to think about how to calculate the posterior. Since we cannot calculate the posterior, we need to think about how to approximate it, right? So, and then if you use variational inference, what you do is that you approximate the posterior distribution using the Kulba label divergence. So basically that is a match, it, it is not an instance, right? But it's a quantity as it can be shown and it is shown here, that given two distributions, it is always non-negative and it's zero if both distribution coincide. So we want to calculate the posterior distribution of the unknown given the observation. Since we know that this is going to be very difficult to calculate that posterior distribution, what we are going to do is to look for a posterior distribution which is close to the true distribution in the Kulba uh, label divergence sense. You may be thinking, okay, you, you don't know the posterior distribution. How can you find how close something is to something you don't know? Give me a couple of slides, but we will solve that. The idea here, we want to approximate the posterior. We don't know it. We select a family of distribution and then to measure how far are we from from the distribution we want to estimate, we use the Kulba label dimension. And here you have uh, the, the proof that it is a, a non-negative uh, quantity and it is zero only if the, both distributions are uh, the same. There are interesting questions regarding which kind of um, divergence should we use? Can we, can we, should we use the reverse or the photo war? Um, Kulba labor divergence, and then um, you, you can go if you want to the Morphy book, the machine learning one dated in 2012. By the way, there is a new one, uh, uh, a, a, a new version coming probably next month, um, where this you can read about this problem, the form of the Kulba labor div divergence and the difference between the forward and the reverse model. Uh, it is well explained there, not in the original book by, by Bishop, but here um, it is very well explained. Um, although it could be used, both of them, depending on how you want to do inference, the, the model we will be using is the reverse Kulbar label. So at the end of the day, what we are going to do is to calculate, try to minimize this quantity, right? So look, think of what we are trying to do. We, we want to estimate one posterior, 
we don't have it. We want to build an, an approximation. And then we want to check which one is the best approximation in the Kullback label divergence sense. The Kullback label is just a, a, a measure of the differences, the discrepancy between these two distribution. It's always no negative. And then we are going to use the reverse one to calculate the, the distance of that. Okay. Now comes the, the, the question of the comments uh, uh, I mentioned a, a couple of slides ago. We want to, to calculate the posterior. We don't know it. But then to select a, an approximation of the posterior, what we do is that we want to minimize this, this quantity. But then, wait a minute, we, we don't have the posterior distribution. We don't have this true underlying posterior distribution of set given x. How can we do that? Well, it happened that if you consider the, the curva labor divergence, it can be written this way, this term plus this one term. Since this one is fixed, what you can do to minimize fix, assuming that the model parameters, I'll talk about that later, uh, you, you can do, what you can do to minimize the curva label divergence is to maximize this quantity. Right, because for uh, the set of parameters of the model given, this quantity, the one on the right, the likelihood is fixed. So instead of minimizing the divergence between the posterior and the uh, distribution you are using to approximate it, what you are going to do is to maximize this quantity. By the way, maybe some of you have already recognized the, the the quantity we are going to maximize, which is the famous elbow. Uh, I guess that you have seen it uh, quite a few times when reading, for instance, <clears throat> on generative adversarial network, bias, and many other models. So basically, at the end of the day, what we are going to do, instead of minimizing the divergence, we are going to maximize this quantity, which is called the evidence lower bound. So instead of minimizing the diverg divergence, we are going to do what we are going to do is to um, calculate the posterior. Um, no, what we are going to do is to approximate the, the model, the posterior distribution by maximizing this quantity here. Right. OK, so um, if the distribution, the prior distribution has model to, to be uh, uh, parameters to be estimated, then uh, those model, those parameters can also be introduced in, in the model. Furthermore, the, the, the posterior distribution we are using to approximate will also have parameters to be to be estimated. Um, and so um, we we need to, to find a way to estimate to estimate the, those parameters of, of the model. Summary so far, what we so far have seen is that um, if we want to minimize the curva labor divergence, what we have to do is to maximize the, the, the elbow. And then the variational inference, what it does is uh, focuses on, on maximizing the elbow. Now, the, the next things we have to do is to decide about which one is the posterior distribution approximation we are going to use. The posterior distribution, uh, um, we intend to use is, is the, one, the one defined by the mean field theory. So we basically do is that we consider the posterior distribution we are using to approximate, to approximate as the product of posterior distribution on the variable we want to, to estimate, right? So that is the so-called so mean field theory. The theory tell us you can go to Bishop or many other books, that the, uh, there is a closed form solution for the posterior distribution for each term. And it is given by this quantity, right? So you can go check for instance, that is very well explained in the Bishop book. You can go and calculate the best posterior, the, the, each of the term you have in the posterior distribution by, by using this equation. This is basically a, a, a mathematical problem. So you have an integral, you, you calculate the expected mean, you, you 
have to do quite a few integral, but at the end of the day, you end up with a posterior distribution. And at the end of the day, my multi by multiplying all the posterior distribution approximation, you end up by having a, um, a posterior distribution approximation of the whole distribution. So you can sample each of them, you can uh, all select the mean of each of them, the mode of each of them, much more than just selecting uh, one term, right? So uh, as I say here, the previous equation is probably the most important uh, variational based equation. You, it tells you how you, you, you can calculate all the, um, the term of the posterior distribution approximation. Look at the, think of the of, of, uh, directed acyclic graph we had at the beginning, fix on node, then the other one, you are calculating the posterior distribution approximation for each of them. I wouldn't say independently, but taking into account the mean of the other. Um, this is the, 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 uh, what we have said. Uh, and here there is a, a problem I want to mention in the past in other talk I, uh, I was mentioning this more, <clears throat> but uh, in some cases you cannot easily calculate this mean, right? For instance, in classification, you have the sigmoid, which is not quadratic and it may be a headache. Uh, so what you do is that you use approximation for, for that model. So uh, this is, in, in theory, things have become uh, very beautiful and nice, but the problem is that the, in real life, you have, it's difficult to assume that you will be able to calculate all the means. So in, much of, in many cases, in many cases, what you have to do is to approximate the, uh, the expected value you want to calculate. So a summary of what we have done so far. Uh, we are close, close to the experimental section. We have observed um, some data in, in our graph. Uh, we have access to, to, the, to the joint and distribution. And then we, to do the approximation we are going to use, we use the, the, mean, fa the mean field theory. And then the mean field theory tell us the, which, uh, how to estimate or how to calculate the, each of the factor in the, the mean field theory. And I'm finishing, because I'm not spending here much more time than I should, uh, I'm finishing uh, with this part is related because I, I guess that you all are, are uh, interested in how this is related to deep learning and some of the model generative model using in deep learning. So, so far I have said, okay, but I know how to, to calculate the, the best uh, the approximating, uh, but how to calculate each of the factor in the posterior distribution approximation. But can we, can we do that, let's say, in a, in a way like gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent? Can we calculate the derivative of the elbow with respect to the parameters we, we have to estimate? And then the, in this slide, by the way, this slide has been taken from this presentation that I found a few weeks ago, I, I, I find it extremely interesting. And then it show you how you can calculate the gradient with respect to the parameter you have to, to estimate. So at the end of the day, the day, the day is telling you what you have to do if you want to use gradient descent to, to estimate the parameter of, of your model. So here you, you have the equation for the, for the gradient or the term. So this can be calculated and this is not complicated because you factorize on all the product you have. The joint distribution is also simple. This can be either calculated in some cases it's known or you can use auto differentiation in using TensorFlow or, or, Py, or PyTorch. And then the, the mean value is, is approximated by using sample. So here, this is, uh, don't get confused. This is not different from, from what I am saying. Here is what I have so far said. That we have been using the mean field theory, but instead of saying which one is the closest form for each of the term involved in the mean field theory, what we are doing here is how to estimate the parameters of the uh, of all the distribution using gradient descent, and, uh, which is used in, in deep learning models, for instance. So an approximation of the gradient is this one, and then you can be you can move from the parameter where you are to, to other parameters. In some cases, there are changes in the in the space where you do the transformation, but the, that is not of I mean it is of interest, but it is not of interest here. Right? So before going to the experiment, I have spent uh, five minutes more than I expected. So uh, before going into the the example, let me. Um, provide you with a uh, take home message. Basically, uh, 
We have been working with Bayesian network. Our goal has been to approximate the posterior distribution. Why we want to do that? Because it is much better than having a, a point estimate of, of the distribution, the mode. <clears throat> We have used the Kulbat labor divergent. You may say, okay, Rafa, why are you using that, uh, that quantity to measure the, the, the quality of, of, the, of the approximation? There are other ways. This one, although there are other divergence which are also used. We, the, we have also introduced the mean field theory, the mean field model, and then been able to calculate the, the best approximation for each of the best posterior for each of the term in the approximation. And then finally, we have seen that all this can be also used to utilize in the deep learning formulation, which is nice because you can use gradient descent to, to parameters. Now that I have finished the, the theory, so I had to select a, a, a few examples. So I, I included um, uh, some, let's say, from my past things I, I, I was doing a, a few years ago, and uh, some more recent thing, uh, things I'm, I'm doing at the at the moment. So I'll, I'll be presenting here, as I said at the beginning, there are um, many slides. I will probably have to skip some of the example, but here you have the I have divided the the presentation of the application in two different uh, parts. One on on image processing, where I plan to use the variational inference approach to solve blind deconvolution, super resolution, the processing of whole slide images, and how to combine analytical and deep learning method um, in inverse problem in images. This is the first part. These are examples I have already prepared. <clears throat> then. Um, for, for machine learning, uh, I'll provide a brief introduction to, uh, to I'll be talking about air application, medical application, crowdsourcing, and finally, <coughs> uncertainty in, in neural uh, network. So let me, let me start with image processing. This is related to um, the, the for example I showed at the, uh, the beginning of the presentation, we have an observation model. So this is the observed image. And then we calculate the we want to calculate the posterior distribution of set, the real underlying image, and also the posterior distribution of the blur. So because we don't know the blur, this is called blind <coughs> deconvolution. It's blind because you don't know the blur. How did we try to solve the, the problem? By the way, I'm, I'm not implying in, in this presentation that you all should be working on variational inference. To me, this is a tool. This is what I use in, in, in my research. There are other approaches which are equally interesting, or more interesting probably to you, but this is like something to, to be in your backpack for you to know that can be applied in some cases or many cases to solve the own problem. But I don't want to give the, the, the wrong impression that, that claiming that this is the way to solve of all the problem by no means. So what do we do to solve this uh, image processing problem? What, what we do is that we simply define a prior, then uh, for, the, for the differences of the in different direction of the original image, we don't know. With that prior, we estimate the blur. And once we have the blur, we estimate the real underlying image using body with what I have just told you, you can more or less follow, maybe not the mathematical derivation, but the, the theory behind the, the papers um, uh, I'm presenting now. So here you have the original image, the first original image, and then another one. And here you have the reconstruction of, <coughs> on, of those images. So the, the, the beauty of the model here is the, the, the sparse priors we were using for, for, the, for the real and underlying image. In this, this work was done by Derina, the student of Aglos Casaglo, that, and I think it was very, very good, extremely nice. Here you have more example. There was a problem with the prior we were using because it, it was a log function and the derivative caused us a lot of problem at, at zero. So we decided to modify that and then we, we ¿Se ha caído Salva, Eugenio? Rafa. ¿Se ha caído Rafa? Se ha caído. Parece que sí. 
Esperamos a que recupere la conexión. Llevaba yo unos minutos que le iba a tener. Yeah. Okay, so um, we are here again. Uh, so I don't know if you have seen. Well, let's assume that we are. Uh, I don't want to. I guess that you have seen the 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 image restoration part, and probably you have missed this one, or have you seen this one as well? Yeah. No, we didn't. We didn't. Where you were still talking about blind convolution, and yeah. we we didn't see the histopathological images. Okay, so uh, uh, let me just show uh, uh, go back quick. So, have you seen this one? No. 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 So uh, mm -hmm. let me skip the theory, and here you have the the, the observation, and um, and then the, here you have the, the the restoration. So so probably I got too excited about talking about the prior, the log prior, the problem we have with the, the derivative, uh, and then um, me gave up and said it was too much theory. So here, this is another example of, of two blur images. These are real images. Um, these are the, the results we, we got. Uh, Su was an, uh, as a, an a student who came uh, from China with a grant for a year, and he stayed with us working on, on image restoration. These are the estimation of the blur, by the way. Here, this is something similar. Let me skip a bit the, the theory. Here you have a few observations. So what you are given is this one, but then when you upsample to, to a size you to the size you want to have, then the image is, uh, doesn't have a good quality. So these are three images you have, and when you combine them, uh, you get this reconstruction. Then here is another example, but then since you have the slides, you can go to the to the paper and, and read it. So finally, finally on the well, not finally, there is another one on on the image processing part. This is work done. Fernando is doing. Let, let me mention that the Fernando here in particular, because the, the title of the three minute thesis, uh, he's the winner of this year at the University of, Gra of Granada, is that the, the devil is in the details. And, and I really believe that that is the case in this problem. So you have images, uh, histological images, they are used for, for classification, but those images, they come from different lab, they have been obtained using different stain, they have been stained differently depending on, on the hospital, and then you want to use those, all of them, to classify, to learn a classifier. So if you take all of them and then put into the classifier, an specialist and histologist wouldn't have any problem in using all of them at the same time. But for, for the machine, you need to normalize all, all the images. So basically what you do is that you, you extract the, the geoxin and the hematoxylin component. And after that, you either go back to the uh, original RGB uh, model or uh, keep in what is called the optical density uh, space. So here, what you have is, um, remember, what we are trying to do here is to obtain the, the real underlying neoxin and hematoxylin. After that, normalize them to put them on the same ground, taking them from different hospital in order to, to be able <coughs> to, to use them for, for a classifier. So here you have an, uh, an example. Uh, on the other hand, uh, having a, a, an image where you you, the quality of the image it may be good, it may be similar to, to the original image. It doesn't mean that you are going to get a good classifier. So in a paper, in this paper, and then we have already submitted in a, a couple of more papers, we are dealing with uh, how, how important the normalizing of the images is. So this is an example of the color normalization. So briefly on, on combining um, deep learning um, and classical approaches in, in 2018, uh, we submitted a paper on, on uh, using deep learning uh, network for inverse problem in, in, in images. To me, there is a very complicated classification that doesn't happen, but uh, in, in image restoration, it does. So you, you have one blur, you obtain an observed image. And then in deep learning, what you want to do is to use the same uh, network to be able to learn all, all the blur. That is not easy, and that is probably the reason why deep learning methods have advanced more in areas of machine learning more, more than in, in image processing. At least that is my, my point of view. This is an example of, of some work we, we did. Um, this part is not uh, variational based at all, but then we are thinking of how to, this is work done in collaboration with Aglos, Casaglos at Northwestern University. He had a grant financed by 
Sony and we move in Santiago and I were, were working with him and, 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 and his team. Um, the idea is how to do super resolution of video that uh, you can imagine is of extreme interest uh, with the high uh, definition TV nowadays, 4K. So let me go to quickly to the machine learning part, um, five more minutes and I'll finish. I don't want to introduce more math, but this is to me very, very beautiful. Uh, I know that some of people in the, in the Institute work on, on Gaussian uh, processes. And then to me, Gaussian process is something very, uh, uh, very intuitive and very nice. So basically what you say is that you have a function and then <clears throat> um, what you are saying is what I have written here, the Gaussian process is a collection of random variable, which are indexes by time of, of space. And then you, you select, you get them, select, no, you, for any subset of, of the, of the collection, of the, collection, the, the joint distribution is, is Gaussian. That allows you to predict when you have an observer given value of X. This is, um, I'm going very quick here. This is something I find extremely interesting uh, and very formative for, for a student because here we, we are using, let me show you, this is the covariance matrix which are used um, in a, a very well known and one we are using uh, in our group uh, as I'll explain in a few, in a few minutes. So here you have the function, uh, a Gaussian process. And then the Gaussian process, depending on, it is like, think of the prior, but the prior is defined on the set of function. It is not defined on a specific point. So you select for any subset of point you get, you, you have a joint uh, Gaussian distribution. So you have a Gaussian distribution, then you also have the observation model, which is a, 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 a Gaussian as well. Uh, and then you can calculate the, the marginal distribution. And then if you can calculate the, mar the marginal distribution, you can calculate the posterior. However, and this is the nice and beautiful part here. Well, here you can do the, the posterior uh, for, for each new sample. The problem here is that since you have million of data, at the end of the day, you have to uh, invert matrices which are a million by a million, and you cannot do that. I mean, it is not that you have to use variational inference because you need to approximate the posterior distribution because you cannot calculate it. No, you can calculate the posterior distribution here. It is beautiful, it can be done easily. However, to do that, you, you have to invert a huge matrix. And since you cannot do that, you need to um, look for approximation, right? So this is what... Uh, uh, an example of the approximation. And the beauty of the, of the approximation is that, it, it, well, in the real case and also in the approximation, is that it will only, it will give you not only the mean value, which coincide with the, with the mode, it will give you the uncertainty of the estimate. So here, for instance, you have quite a few sample in this area, but here, and so the uncertainty of the model, the uncertainty of your prediction, which tell you how confident you should be on your prediction is lower in this area where you have a lot of observation than here where you have no no observation right so this is the 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 explanation why we use uh, the why we need to use variational inference here because we don't have the the we cannot invert the matrices we need to invert so let me give you three four minutes of, uh, on on this here is an example of how to example or how you use that on, on, on F application, right? So this is working collaboration with Gustavo in, and his team at the, the University of Valencia. And the idea in this case is um, to, to detect, uh, well, different parameters or to detect cloud in, 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 uh, in images, in Landsat images. Here is uh, how to work with volcanoes. So we were using Gaussian processes to differentiate different uh, classes of uh, recording uh, in the, of the signal. So there were five different classes. From then uh, we took uh, extracted features and with those features we were um, able to do classification using Gaussian processes and deep Gaussian processes. Here is medical imaging, and if this is an image of, um, or a histological image of, of the prostate. And uh, the idea is to do classification here. So the, the process is, uh, I'll go quickly on this. So uh, in prostate, you have different grades. So it may be, there are no problems, grade one and two, which are 
V9, uh, and then uh, for grade three, four, three, four, and five, there, there are problems, let's say. So the way it is done is that you have the images, eoxin and hematoxylin images, you have to, because why to extend? Because they, they uh, let's say, mark or outline a uh, different part of interest of the image. The stroma, which is pink, which is highlighted by the eoxin, and the one which is blue, the epithelial nuclei, which, which is uh, highlighted by the hematoxin. So this is the, the marking process where the, the, the expert um, annotate the region where there is grade three or grade four. And then we want to do is that we want to calculate uh, to uh, somehow uh, be able to, uh, to, to build good classifier. So this is what we have done here with the use of um, feature extracted by our colleague, uh, the Politecnica of Palencia. They provided that with the features and then we use Gaussian processes to do the classification. Um, we have been doing some work, some additional work, because one of the problems in, in histological images, I don't want to spend much time on this, is that we need to, uh, there are many images, there are not ma many uh, pathologists, so you need to either give images of different pathologists, you have the crowdsourcing problem, uh, or you may ask the pathologist to outline where the if an image, or to say, if an image is, uh, if a whole slice image uh, is malignant or benignant, but without annotating the, the image. So what we are doing now is considering each of the image images as a back of patches, and then decide, uh, use a multiple instant learning approach to, to solve that problem. By the way, we have also done some work on that in collaboration with people at Northwestern University with the data they have and they have been used to detect whether a person had hemorrhage and then should be go to intensive care or not, uh, depending on the condition. Basically, you are given a volume and then the, the person, the doctor tell you that person has or has not. And then, but you don't know the slides where the, that is happening. And what we are doing at the moment is, is combining deep learning model to extract the features uh, together with uh, Gaussian processes to do the classification. To do the classification. By the way, I, I believe that is a problem of, of, of enormous interest, right? Where you use a, a deep learning model to extract feature and then in an end-to-end -end manner, you uh, also would utilize a, a Gaussian process. I have already talked about crowdsourcing. Um, this, there is only one, a few slides, this one uh, and the one on the work Pablo has done. This is the crowdsourcing problem. In the crowdsourcing problem, different annotator annotate images or whatever it is, maybe uh, in our cases, mainly images, although it can be other things. And there, there may be disagreement be between what the, what the annotators say. Right? So we want to uh, extract the, the true underlying classifier and also relate uh, how each annotator work uh, in relation to, to that uh, underlying classifier. Not, not, notice that that is important because it may highlight where the uh, one uh, pathologist in training is having problem with the uh, with his or her training because uh, he or she doesn't know how that to classify properly a particular kind of image. So this is the, the example I, I show at the beginning. We have different slides uh, annotated by different people. Um, and then we also, we first apply this to the LIGO project where we had, this is huge, right? Glitches are a pattern of noise in the images. And the idea was to uh, be able to build a crowdsourcing model for, for this problem. Why a crowdsourcing? Because there was um, a, a site on the web and people were not expert. There was not one person annotating all the example of all the glitches. There were people with different expertise and the idea was to combine the expertise provided by all of them to classify uh, those images. So here you have the, the, prob the paper we have recently published on, on, the, on the topic. Uh, pattern recognition, information fusion, uh, PAMI, um, also recently in scientific report. And the final project uh, I wanted to, to discuss very briefly, but I, I think it's extremely interesting. So imagine that when you get to the, to the uncertainty, 
when you get to the sigmoid, the ReLU, or whatever you are using in your network, you introduce uncertainty there. So this is what you have here in a neural network. You have the weight, you have the activation function, that maybe the sigmoid or ReLU, whatever it is, and then you get the function, right? In the Bayesian neural network, you obtain, you use distribution on the weight. Uh, the one I said at the beginning, W that had the weight at the beginning, the, the prior, which was uh, the Gaussian distribution of zero mean and variance something. Um, and then you can try to calculate the posterior, right? In the deep Gaussian processes, the uncertainty is given by the, by the covariance matrix. But think of a problem where you, the uncertainty, it is in the activation function. The activation acts like a Gaussian process, and then is the the uncertainty is response. Uh, uh, the activation function is the responsible of, of the uncertainty of the model. It is not deterministic. There is the random component. It is there. Um, I, I don't have much time to uh, to talk more about this, but I believe that this is extremely interesting. The the, the kernel we, we are using this is work done by Pablo. Um, this is the kernel we are using is extremely interesting and we plan to use it in, in different problems in, that we are dealing with at the moment. So let me just finish off uh, uh, with a summary of the talk. Of the talk, I, uh, I like, I love Kurban label divergence. Why I, I like it? Because I think it's a nice tool to, to solve real problem. I don't mean it is the best one, it is not the unique one. But uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to, to solve problem because I think it's allowed you to make things simpler, simpler, but not so simple that you lose more of the information you're looking for. So I apologize for extending for using more time than I should. Uh, and thanks for the attention to the presentation. Thank you. Gracias. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rafa, for your nice talk and interesting talk. Um, I think now it's time to make questions. So um, now it's the time of uh, just three people to make questions to our speaker. So anybody have prepared uh, any question? Feel free to write on the chat or to open your uh, microphone uh, and talk. So, okay, Rafa, <clears throat> I, I see that you are working on crowdsourcing. Uh -huh. And uh, do you have any work, okay, because I, I, I know that there are some people also in natural language processing that they work on uh, crowdsourcing and also to use uh, motion uh, processes on it. So, what is your opinion to, to, to translate, okay? Uh, the Gaussian process for crowdsourcing also most useful in natural language processing. Um, and in let, let me let me use the the headphone because I don't hear you very well. So, what is my opinion on? Yes, what is your opinion to use? So, okay, these techniques of uh, to evaluate uh, crow workers, okay, the annotators in a crowdsourcing experiment in other tasks that uh, they are not. Uh, in the annotation of images, for example, in natural language processing. Yeah, um, some of the example we, we, we have been using, I think it's in the pattern reconnection paper, one of the example is on, on text, right? Where I think it was um, Rotten X or something like that, that was the database we were using there uh, to see if people liked some of the images they, they have seen or not or not because they, they had the sentence and it wasn't clear whether the, uh, it was right or, or I mean it was positive or, or, or negative the the evaluation it doesn't have to be uh, to me Gaussian processes well, crowdsourcing to me crowdsourcing is it, a way to alleviate the problem of annotating a lot of images or example or whatever you are working with. So it doesn't have to be images, can be other things, but that is a way where you say, okay, instead of having uh, one person annotating or 
people with similar, uh, similar expertise annotating all the, all the images or all the data, let's assume that we have uh, more annotators and there are discrepancies uh, among them, and then we, we try to cover them. By the way, but this is something that I have been discussing with uh, Arne, one of the students, and Miguel, um, a few people. To me, it is important because it is difficult to imagine a situation where everybody will, where just one person will be annotating all the images in a data set. Yeah. Um, and also this is related, it, I wouldn't say it's the other side of the coin, but somehow it's related, the, the field of active learning. So but you you don't want to, to annotate thousands and thousands of images. Uh, some of them are already well described in the model you have. You want the, the expert to annotate the data, whatever the data, which uh, adds something to the model. So you need to find a way to select uh, um, samples which are relevant and which are going to provide more information or, 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 or your classifier or, or whatever you are using. Um, and also related to that is how you should be maintaining your system. To me, in, in histological image classification, that doesn't make much sense, or in any system, doesn't make much sense to, to have a classifier, uh, have the paper accepted, let's say, and then uh, in medicine, for instance, you, you try to use it. Uh, are you going to, it's going to be the model frozen forever? It's, it's not going to change. Who is going to provide more data? How the model is going to be improved? Crowdsourcing is a way to alleviate that. Multiple instant learning can also be understood as a way to alleviate that problem the same as um, active learning. But to your question, yes, it has been applied to, to other models. I, I was, yesterday I was reading a paper on, on communication on the use of crowdsourcing technique to, for, to detect the position of different areas of, of interest. So images can be, at the end of the day, it's not images because our images are translated into the into features and those are the, the input to, to the model. So it doesn't have to be only uh, images. Anything that you have features can be applied to crowdsourcing or can crowdsourcing be used. Okay, so um, thank you, Rafa. And the second question is, uh, what is uh, the experience of your research group or in the use of uh, crowdsourcing platform. I, I don't know if you, you have worked with uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, with Crowdflower or whatever. So what is your experience on those uh, platforms and to configure out uh, crowdsourcing experiments? Well, the, uh, we, have it, we, we have used data, database data provided by, by people. For instance, the, uh, the, in the LIGO project, the, the one uh, Pablo Morales went to work uh, in, in at Northwestern University. They provided that with the data. They were collected by them, so we, we did not interact with with the people during with the interface with the platform. We we haven't done uh, anything in, in that front. Now we are working. We are collaborating with people at Northwestern. Lee Cooper is uh, working there at, at the University of of not working and he's he has just by the way if you are interested in, in crowdsourcing he has just published a a, um, a crowdsourcing database on on a huge number of histological images with a huge number of annotators that we are trying with with our method but we we don't have experience on the on the use of or on the development of um, crowdsourcing platform for classification right all of them have been provided by someone. Okay, so are there any questions in the audience for, for our speaker? So, uh, Rafa, uh, if we don't have any more questions, okay, thank you a lot thanks, thanks for, for, the your, for your presentation. Uh, thanks a lot for your answer to my questions. And I think it was a very nice uh, for the audience to, to, to listen. Uh, another way to, um, to tackle the problem of uh, image classification and all the related topics as crowdsourcing and so on. So thank you very much for the participation. Thank, thanks to you for, for inviting me. And uh, hopefully, Eugenio, we will meet again and have lunch together as we did two years ago that we haven't been able to do that recently. <laughs> <laughs>
and also yeah. to have a cup, uh, some cup of coffee in the Pikik. Uh, that's right. That's right. As that's right. And to speak about books. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Have a nice evening. Have a nice afternoon. Afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Gracias.